On today's program, OSU Stillwater Campus's forester, Chris Martin, shows how to properly plant a container-grown tree. Turfgrass specialist Justin Moss establishes Bermuda grass from seed. Chris Martin has a do-it-yourself method of horizontal tree staking. Barbara Brown prepares pipe rod. And we have information about our new Viewer's Garden Contest. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Hi, I'm Chris Martin. I'm the urban forester here at uh, OSU on the Stillwater campus. And today we wanted to discuss uh, planting a tree. Um, here on campus, we're really trying to increase our diversification um, and size and species. And so this morning, we're uh, gonna talk about a magnolia and it's a containerized plant. Um, so we're gonna go through the steps of how you do that. Um, first off, we wanna talk about when you're planting a tree, um, you really wanna match the tree to the site. That's really important. It's gonna be there for its life. Um, so you really wanted to give it a good head start by starting with the appropriate species for the site. Um, here at Theta Pond, it's where we are this morning. Um, it's a little bit more acidic and a little bit wet, so we went with the magnolia. Um, there's plenty of them around here along with bald cypress, which both do well in that condition. So um, you wanna match the site first. The next thing is the quality of the tree. You wanna try to get the best quality you can. Uh, you wanna look for a straight trunk, um, really not many broken branches. Um, it happens in shipping some, but you, know, you w really want a straight trunk, a uniform trunk, um, with no leaning or cankers or knots or curves in it. Um, and then we'll talk about what we do when we uh, take it out of the container. Um, you know, digging the hole, I guess, is the biggest starter, right? Everybody thinks you just get a tree, you buy it, you plant it, you dig a hole and throw it in there. Um, really, you want the hole to be about two to three times the width of the tree. Um, it really helps just kind of give it a, a good area to, of soft, loose soil to help establish. Um, and then you really, the other important thing is, along with the the tree being, the, or seeing the root flare, you really want it to be above grade. Um, here with the containers, we find that you can put it two inches above grade and it normally doesn't settle too much. Um, some of the times it will, but you really want it to be above grade just in case it settles a little. Um, and then with containers, they, they normally have more girdling root issues than B and B trees do. Um, simply because it's in a container, it hits the wall and it circles. So when we take it out, we really want to look at that. Um, if we need to, we, we're going to cut the roots some or loosen them up a little bit just so that it'll give them um, a better chance. You know, you don't want them to circle because if you plant it like that, it's gonna continue to grow like that. So you wanna cut them or loosen them up so they can spread out. So this is a, a magnolia. And one of the things you wanna think about when you're putting the tree in is that it's really important to go back with the native soil. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the past about putting gravel in or compost and stuff like that. And it, it really doesn't help. It actually can be a hindrance, um, it can cause water to sit and hold in there. Um, so you really want to go back with the native soil. That's what it's got to spend its life in. So that's what you want to put back in. Um, and then the other thing, especially with containers, I mentioned the gir girdling roots and you can tell by this one, there's uh, not necessarily girdling, but you know, they're wrapped around a bit. So we want to try to just scrape it if we can, scrape them free. You can cut it some of the times um, with a hand saw or something, but I really like if you can, just scrape it and kind of loosen them. You can pull them apart. That way you want to, you don't want them to be wrapping around like this. You really want them to be kind of out straight. So just kind of wiggle it around a bit, loosen up the soil. Um, and with this one as well, you can see it might be hard to tell, but it looks like this side is a little buried. So I remember I, I mentioned the root flare. You really want that to be exposed and not covered. So we'll just kind of shake it out a little bit and loosen it up and you can tell it's a little bit more exposed and it was a little covered here and um, we'll probably want to snip these 
right here around the trunk that's girdling. We'll want to clip this root because it's it would as, as as it grows it would end up girdling the trunk, and then we'll probably clip this off too. Um, it, it looks like the root has come up, and so as time goes on and the root grows, it could end up girdling. So we'll want to go ahead and or pushing against the trunk. So we'll want to go ahead, and that may seem like a lot of roots, but if you look in here, it, it has plenty of roots. So I, one is it going to really do as much damage as compared to leaving it? Um, it could really do a lot more damage by leaving it later. And it's really important too to remember that as you loosen these and we spread them out like that, and the reason you dig the big hole is so that it'll establish and they'll grow out. Most of the roots, or 90% of the roots are in the top 18 inches of the soil or so. So it's, it's kind of a, people don't really understand that it's not a mirror image. The roots spread more laterally than they do deeply and down. And one last thing to think about uh, before you start shoveling the soil in is a lot of times containerized trees are staked. Um, so you really don't want to leave them on as well. So it's best to cut them off at this point. You can just take hand snips or a knife even. Um, you just want to be careful. You don't want to cut into the tree. Um, and it can happen. But if you, if you pay attention and just cut straight, uh, hopefully you'll prevent that. But you want to take these off. Um, because a lot of people forget it with staking um, on the tree and with these, they, they can girdle it as well if you leave them on for too long. Hi, I'm Madison Anderson and I'm currently an intern for Oklahoma Gardening, majoring in Agricultural Communications and Agribusiness at Oklahoma State University. In 2014, we held our first home garden contest in several years, and it was a great success. This year, we'll be having another contest, but the focus will be on water. This can be rain gardens, water gardens, xeriscaping, green roofs, anything that has to do with water in some special way. We want to see how Oklahomans are dealing with the lack of water we have faced recently, and we want to see how you deal with water when it does come. Entries will be submitted in May, so watch for our Facebook page and our show for more information on how to submit your entries. In June, the Oklahoma Gardening staff will narrow it down to 10 finalists, and then voting will take place on our Facebook page. This will decide who will be on the special episode of Oklahoma Gardening. If you have any questions regarding the contest, please feel free to send us a Facebook message or an email. Also pay attention to all of our social media outlets for more information regarding the contest. We're excited to see what Oklahomans are doing in their own backyards, and we hope to see you in your garden this summer. So I'd like to show you a little bit about preparing an area and planting an area to Bermuda grass seed. And so uh, what we'll see here is one of the first things we look at is, is how do we prepare the soil, get it ready for our seed. You know, at first, uh, it may be an area where there's already grass growing. If that's the case, we're gonna have to uh, come in uh, maybe the fall before you wanna plant uh, the Bermuda grass and spray that area out with a non-selective herbicide such as a glyphosate. And then the following spring, do it again, spray it out again and to make sure there's no living material there and then you want to get the soil ready so you may have to come in and till the soil up and you'll see that as you do that the first time the soil is going to look a little bit rough and not quite ready for planting and then as you uh, continue on uh, breaking up that soil uh, you can get a rake on it or something like that and start to smooth the area out so here where I'm standing you, st you start to see where the area is getting closer to pr uh, being prepared but as I walk through this uh, you'll see some footprints here and these footprints are still a little bit deep and what we're trying to do is create a really a firm uh, and a clean and a smooth seed bed. So we're really clean here and we're, we're starting to get really smooth here but we're not quite firm enough yet because and I can tell that just by looking at my footprints as I walk through here. So to firm it up a little bit we may need something like a roller or a tamper and, and just try to firm this seed bed up a little bit more and here, here as I walk through this area you can see my footprints are no longer uh, going deep into the soil and this is pretty much getting ready now for our seeding. So the next step is what we'd have to do is uh, take a soil test and we want to test this soil to look at what are our nutrients, what are our nutrient levels. 
And so we're really concerned about our nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three main elements. But also, if you want to, you can pay a little extra on that soil test and look at your secondary nutrients or your micronutrients. If your phosphorus and or potassium is sufficient, then don't add any more to the soil. And when we're at this situation right here, we're really at our greatest threat for, for losing nutrients through runoff or leaching when there's no vegetation yet. So if you don't need it, don't add it. Now, nine times out of 10, you're gonna be deficient in nitrogen. You're gonna to have to add a little nitrogen to get this seed started. And if the soil test says you need phosphorus or potassium, add that as well at the recommended rates. So here we have a couple of different spreaders and these can be used to put your fertilizer out once you do your soil test, but also can be used to, to spread your seed out. So Bermuda grass seed is actually quite small. And um, I just have a, a sample of seed here from one of our OSU developed grasses, Riviera Bermuda grass, very well adapted to Oklahoma. And you see that it's purple, so this is actually treated seed. If you see Bermuda grass seed that just looks brown, it's probably untreated seed. And so um, it, it's really good to go with maybe a product that you see has been treated to help with disease and other issues. You can plant untreated seed as well. But uh, what you want to do is just plant this Bermuda grass, whether it's treated or not, at one to two pounds of pure live seed per thousand square feet. So since this is treated seed, there's actually some other material here uh, sprayed onto the seed in addition. So actually with this, it adds about 50% to the weight. So we, if we're gonna plant a one to two pound of pure live seed, when we have treated, we actually have to bump that up to about two to three pounds of treated seed per thousand square feet. And it actually says that right here on the label, plant two to three pounds of this particular brand of seed. So once we do that, we can calibrate our spreader so it's putting out the right amount. And a lot of times what people will do is they'll say if they wanna to calibrate to two pounds, for the area, they'll actually calibrate their spreader to do one pound of seed, and they'll go one direction with one pound, and then go the other direction with another pound to ensure uniform coverage, and that's always a good thing to do. Today, we're gonna to demonstrate actually with a drop spreader, and the, uh, the difference between the rotor and the drop is the rotary spreads the seed out kind of all around you, and the drop spreader is just gonna drop right down in between the wheels. And be sure to check out our fact sheets on how to establish your lawn and how to maintain after you plant. Here you can see this is uh, one way we stake trees here on campus. Uh, we do wood stakes. They're non-treated stakes, um, so you don't have to worry about any chemicals or anything like that. Um, you can get them anywhere. Uh, Lowe's, Walmart, any place like that, probably the mill. Um, they're readily available. It's just a pine furring strip and stakes. Um, the couple things to think about is, I know there's kits out there for homeowners to use. Um, I think this is a better way to do it, in my opinion. Um, a lot of those stakes, uh, homeowner kits, they really, it either goes into the ball, the root ball itself, or into the loose soil um, that you've created around it. And really that doesn't do, that defeats the purpose kind of because you want it to be stable. Um, with that loose soil or the ball, it's not gonna be as stable. So we go outside of the loose soil into this, the ground um, and that's where we stake them. So it's a little, little bit bigger, um, but you know, that's good because we make our mulching a little bit bigger too. Um, so, you know, the, the, they could be a tripping hazard, I suppose, um, but we mulch over them. Um, so it, unless you're not paying attention, you really, really shouldn't have an issue. Um, the one thing that we like about these two is uh, we don't have to take them off. We just let them be. Uh, within a couple years, they start to degrade. We've seen a couple times where we freshen a mulch um, and the zone people have pulled them and they're half rotten on the bottom side. So with the mulch and the water and everything, they start to degrade by themselves and you really, you do it once and you're done. You don't have to think about it. Um, the one thing I would caution against is here, um, you want it to be on the ball, but you don't want it to be too close to the trunk because even though they can degrade and they get soft after a couple of years, you don't want it to be too close where it can rub up against the trunk as the trunk uh, enlarges. So that's the one caution or concern I would have. Just make sure you space it out enough, but you want it to be in the meat of the ball, not on the edge where it can slip off. We've got it filled back in. Um, we put a mulch ring around or a, a water reservoir around it. And part of what we did is come out outside of those stakes like we talked about just to hopefully prevent anyone from tripping. Um, 
the other thing is we don't put any soil on the root ball. We don't want to cover the root ball. Um, and we water it in before we mulch just so in case the soil sinks a little bit, we can add some more. A lot of times uh, air pockets will settle in and you'll get a big hole in there. So we watered in a little bit just to make sure everything's okay and we don't have to add more soil. Um, <clears throat> and you can tell by some of the shots, there's some fertilizer here and it looks like Osmocote, slow release, but that was in the container when we planted it. We don't normally fertilize the first year uh, after we plant a tree. We want it to kind of establish it's going through a stress period anyway, so we don't want to potentially stress it more or burn the root tips or anything like that. So we put the ring around it um, and then we water it in and then we'll, uh, we'll end up mulching it and we'll end up uh, watering it again just to get a good soaking. You really want to give it a good soaking when you plant it, um, it's going to go through some stress. So you want to soak and make sure the soil gets in and you want to really focus on the root ball as well and make sure that gets really wet. Um, and then for the future, um, you know, we normally, we water, try to water our trees for the first year, hopefully the first two years. Uh, it depends on the zones and how many trees we have and what's going on. But we try for at least two years to do it, definitely for a year. And there's some research out there, you know, in the past, a lot of people say you want to water it in slowly and deeply. Um, there's some newer research out there for transplants and new trees that you really would, it's better to give them short waterings more frequent. So we water our trees three times a week um, and we base it on the DBH. It's five gallons of water per DBH a tree. This is a 30 gallon, but probably a one, one and a half inch. So we'll probably give it about, I would say it's better to go over a little bit. So we'll give it 10 gallons uh, per watering. Um, you know, and we have the zone guys checked though. That, we say Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, that doesn't mean they have to do it. If it's wet or it's holding water, then you don't want to continue to water it. Um, you want to make sure it's adequately moist, but you don't want to overwater. So we have them probe before they water. Um, and so hopefully it's, you know, it could be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It could be Monday. Um, it could be Monday and Wednesday. You know, it just depends on how, how well it's holding and if it needs the water. You don't want to give it too much because that can kill it. Um, and so we'll normally fertilize in the second year after that, but then the watering I think is really the, the most critical part of the aftercare. Um, you know, when you plant also, you wanna prune anything that's broken or damaged. Um, after that, we normally wait till year two to really kind of get into structural pruning, let it get established. You don't wanna take any green off um, too early. So we let it get established and then year two, we might start our structural pruning on it. And so th this may seem a little different than a lot of people think about. You just dig a hole and put the tree in there, but it's really worth the effort. Uh, you go through a little bit more effort up front and that's gonna set the tree up for um, a, a better quality of life later on. Um, the more you give it attention now in the first 10 years or so, the better the tree is gonna perform and the more happy you're gonna be with it. Hi, I'm Katie Rose and I'm an intern at Oklahoma Gardening. I'm also an agricultural communications and agricultural business student at Oklahoma State University. With the support of our Oklahoma Gardening fans, we've expanded our social media platforms. You can now find Oklahoma Gardening on Twitter at OK Gardening and Instagram at Oklahoma Gardening. If you don't happen to be on Twitter or Instagram, you can still find the same great information on our Facebook page. All of our social media platforms will continue to share gardening tips and photos, and you can also find segments and our full episodes on our YouTube channel. Be on the lookout for our web-only videos that offer great information as well. Also, be sure to subscribe to our Oklahoma Gardening's classic channels where you can find segments from our previous toast. This technology has enhanced the Oklahoma Gardening program and has provided timely research-based information from the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. We'd love to help our viewers with their lawns and gardens, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in. If you happen to know of a location or an event you feel should be featured on the show, let us know. We love to hear from our viewers. Today we're doing something with a vegetable that many of us grow but not a lot of us respect, and that's your traditional green bell pepper. Most of us now kind of say, oh, I like the red one or the orange one or the yellow one or the purple one, but this one's got a lot going for it. And today we're going to do something that's very traditional in the Basque culture, uh, and it's called piperad or pepper sauce. It's how we're going to translate it. So I'm going to start with about a cup of onion that I thinly sliced. 
and I'd use a yellow onion or a white onion for this. So we're going back to the basic vegetables here. And then I've got two medium bell peppers that are just kind of coarsely chopped. And I had three tablespoons of uh, olive oil in the pan. You could use another type as well. And then a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. We're just going to stir these together and we're going to let them saute at a fairly low temperature because we want them, the onions, to uh, become more translucent. But we want it to happen real slowly. We don't want any browning going on as, as we do this. Uh, so we're going to, again, turn the heat down fairly low and let this go for about 10 minutes before we add anything else to it. So this one is, is really simple, but it's going to take uh, around a half an hour to actually get the, the cooking done. Okay, you can see that the onion has become fairly translucent and the peppers are still holding their shape, which is our goal. We're going to add to this now four cloves of garlic. Now you could either use the bottled version or you can do the mincing and peeling and, and the whole shebang yourself. Uh, but this we don't want to cook very long, maybe about a minute. So you need to have the next few ingredients ready to go because the next one is actually one that's going to take a fair amount of time. What it is is two cups of Roman tomatoes. Now they start lo out looking like this as opposed to a slicing tomato. The idea is that they have more meat, less liquid in them. I did catch as much juice as I could, but you need to blanch them, which means you're going to put them in boiling water, submerge them in boiling water for 30 to 60 seconds. It's real helpful if you make a real light uh, X on the bottom with a knife, and that enables you to see whether you need to leave them in for 30 seconds or for a minute. Uh, because it'll start to peel back and you'll know that they're ready to come out of the hot water and go immediately into cold water, uh, ice water preferably, until they cool down. And then you can peel them, uh, chop them, core them as necessary. So we've got two cups of those, which is four or five of them. Uh, those are going to go in here. And the next ingredient that we're going to add is about a teaspoon of sugar to cut some of the bite on the tomatoes. And then a really interesting one um, that actually makes this from the area of the world that it should be almost. We're taking some liberties with it because we don't live in the south of France or the north of Spain. So what I have here is a half a teaspoon of hot paprika. Now this is opposed to um, regular paprika or smoked paprika. It's not exactly the, the pepper, the ground pepper that they would use in that part of the country, but it's closest to it. It looks very much like cayenne, but cayenne is going to be way more hot. Uh, on the Scoville scale, it may be up at uh, 30,000 as opposed to the hot paprika, which is going to be um, more around four to 6,000. So it's substantially less of a dramatic uh, taste, but it gives it enough of a bite and enough of that traditional uh, feel uh, in your mouth that it, it is as close as we can come without ordering special ingredients online. So what we're going to do now is going to put a lid on this. We're going to let it simmer at, uh, at a low heat, stirring it from time to time for about 15 minutes. We want it to cook long enough uh, that the flavors have had time to blend together, uh, but we don't want the peppers and the onions to actually lose their shape. We want to still be able to tell what's what here when we get uh, to eating it. So about 15 minutes, and we've got one more ingredient, and then we'll be ready to eat. All right. Looks great. It's just where I want it to be. Now, you'll notice that there's still quite a bit of liquid here. So it kind of depends on what you're going to do with it. It is a pepper sauce, and you could serve it over a pasta or over rice. Very often, this particular uh, dish is served with a fairly bland, uh, blandly seasoned kind of fish or poultry uh, it, because it's, itself has a lot of flavor. So it, depending on how you're serving it, you may want to leave all this liquid. You have the option, however, of leaving it in the pan with the lid off for about five minutes and evaporating some of that liquid. Uh, and I'm going to take the other option, and I'm going to take it off the heat at this point, or at least turn the heat off, and I'm going to stir in um, two tablespoons of capers. Now, capers are buds of the, the caper bush, 
that have been pickled, usually in a salt brine, sometimes a salt and vinegar brine, uh, and then they, they, are go they go ahead and can them. Uh, these particular ones on, are non uh which simply is a reference to size. You'll often see uh, that phrase on the package or on the bottle of capers. So I'm going to go ahead and stir these in. You might, if, if you've not tried capers before, uh, try them before you stir it all in or take some out and stir it in a little bit. Uh, so you can decide if, in fact, capers are something that you want to add to it. They are an option. They're not traditional from the Basque part of the, of the country. They're actually more traditional for southern Italy. Now, what I'm going to do with this, uh, you have several options, as I mentioned. You could serve it along a, a, a mildly seasoned uh, fish or poultry. What I have actually done is put it inside of a grilled cheese. So you can see that in there with a little bit of a, a, just a cheddar cheese and a, a whole grain or a multi-grain bread. You could also do it in one that's plain, just a regular traditional gr grilled cheese, and serve it on the side. Either way, it's a great addition. Uh, maybe we don't always have to have tomato soup with our grilled cheese. Maybe we can expand our taste buds and expand our world and do something a little bit different. I hope you'll try this recipe. It's Pipe Rod for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown. Next week we'll be fertilizing our blackberries, controlling Bermuda grass, looking at an ornamental strawberry, planting peanuts, and making a spinach salad. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.